Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Sorry. Good morning, yeah. It is 10.30 now. Um, you've all been sitting here for 10 minutes looking at me, but thanks for being so timely and for being so punctual. Uh, my name is Andrea, and today I'll be presenting copywriting tips for better UX. And I just wanted to uh, thank the organizers of WordCamp Toronto for inviting me to present here. I'm from Montreal, so not too far, but I do organize the WordCamp in Montreal, so I know just how much work goes into these events. And so um, kudos to them, and also thanks to our sponsors. I work for SiteGround, so I'm a sponsor and a speaker here, which is kind of fun. Um, but let's move on to why you're here, which is to hear about copywriting. Um, so my name is Andrea, and I study journalism. Uh, at Concordia in Montreal, but I worked in tech for about four years, and I'm also the chief content creator at SiteGround. And that's my Twitter handle. If you want to tweet out things, follow me. I'll be also tweeting out these slides um, right after the talk, so you can get them. Uh, so in the four years that I've worked in content creation and in tech, of course, I've learned a lot of things about internet um, behavior and about how people engage with content and what makes for good web content and all of these tips and tricks about how to improve that so that people are really getting the most from the time that they spend on your website and the content that they read. But I would say that what gives me the most um, credibility in giving this talk on, accessi on uh, UX and um, copywriting is just how much time I spend online every day. I think. I'm one of those people that always has my phone. I always have a device in my hand. I'm always looking at multiple screens, and I'm just spending so much time on the internet, whether it's consuming content, shopping, um, engaging with people on social media. And just that exposure to it, I've seen a lot of good things and a lot of bad things about how people build their websites and about how people write content and develop and design their interfaces. So I wanted to share with you today some of the good, some of the bad, some of the ugly, but mostly how you can learn to improve the way that your website performs by changing the little pieces of text that are um, all throughout your website. But before we get to the, the, the meat of the content and what we're really going to be talking about, I wanted to highlight an experience that I've had recently that sort of explains why we need to be making these decisions and why these decisions aren't going to be made for us and why um, we need to be really careful about the decisions we made when designing UX interfaces for our users. So everyone has taken an elevator before, correct? I mean, it's a pretty straightforward experience. You're staying in suite 601, you get on your elevator, you press 6, and then you quickly close the closed door button so no one else gets on the elevator after you, right? You want to be alone. Um, but what about that button that takes you down to the ground floor? What is that button? Like, what's the label on it? And so in the past couple weeks, I've been in like Boston, Seattle, uh, Montreal, Toronto, uh, New York, and I sort of like wanted to take a look at all the different types of buttons that you can see for the ground floor. So like zero, one, one with a star, S for street level, which is like weird to me, um, G and RC, which is an abbreviation in French for, for the ground floor. So I would say that, you know, in a lot of cases you expect to have some standardization. In a lot of cases, you, you know, that is really good to have, you know, a really set determined um, rule for the way we design things. But in real life, that's not always the case. You know, we have these discrepancies. We have this diversity of design decisions. And it's the same in web development. And I would say that it's also the same in when we use our microcopy. So microcopy is all these little bits of text that are throughout your website that seem really um, simple and almost stupid and are often built into templates so you don't even think about them. But you can edit these. And these are things that um, you can used to work to your advantage so that your website's cohesive and so it really, and it does what you want it to do. Um, so I'm, I've developed this talk uh, and divided into three different points. And so my three points here to help you improve those little bits of text that are throughout your website are to think big, to perfect the small, to design with empathy, and to keep it simple. So the first one, big picture thinking. Um, a couple of years ago, I gave a talk in WordCamp Kansas City, and it was all about content audits and improving the content on your website. And it was more geared towards larger organizations and um, agencies, because that's sort of what the crowd was there. But what the main takeaway was that content doesn't exist in a silo. It cuts across every part of your organization or part of your business. And so it's not something that you can just design and develop on its own. It really has to work with everything else that you're doing, whether it's your who, who your audience is, how you're targeting them, what your product does. Content's really going to get into all of that, and it has to support that. 
So that's why content writers have a pretty interesting role in a company, because they're working with the developers, or they're working with the stakeholders. They're the ones who are going to be telling the story um, of what your company, your organization, or even just your personal brand, what it is that you do. And uh, they need to work with everyone. And so that's why developing a big picture so that every, everyone can be on the same page is an important part of, of a content strategy for your site. And it also impacts your microcopy. So start, like I would say you zoom out. You know, Even if you're talking about what kind of label you're going to put in your checkout cart, it all starts with who your company is. Who are you? What, and, and you know, I know in this room we're talking a lot of people that just have one website. Some people work for organizations or hospitals, schools um, that work in agencies. But so take this as more of like a general understanding of brand. Um, but you need to determine things like what are uh, your company's mission? Uh, what do you want people to feel about your brand? If you could picture your brand as a person, how would they act and sound? And so that's something that is really interesting to think about because the way that you interact with a website can seem really robotic, but it doesn't have to be. You can develop a, a tone of voice where it feels like you're interacting with a human and it puts forward the, the human aspect of what your company is and that builds trust because when someone feels like they're interacting with a real individual, then you can get them to really listen to you. And so I always encourage people who are working on a project to think about their brand, to think about what they're trying to convey and to come up with a north star of who that person is or who that brand is. And that helps you then determine a tone of voice. And it helps you also to make these decisions so that it fits into your tone of voice and your branding guidelines. Because what I like to say is there's no accidental copy, or I hope there's no accidental copy. I know that we're all super busy, so the idea of going in and editing every single thing that's on our website might seem impossible. A lot of us wear multiple hats, so you may be the copywriter and the designer. You may be the owner and you may be doing all of this yourself. Um, but if you have the time to go in, it's really nice to make sure that every single thing is intentional on your website. So not to have any accidental copy, um, but to have really things that you've chosen. And so part of that is asking yourself questions. Who's my audience? What's the purpose of this piece of content or copy? And does it make sense in a whole? As a whole, throughout my website, does everything work together to meet my, um, to fit into my branding guidelines? And so these are things that you also want to consider throughout any design project. Like, what do you want people to feel when they interact with your, um, do they want to feel knowledge? Do you want them to feel knowledgeable, empowered, reassured? And throughout that, are you staying true to your branding guidelines that you've established as, as a team? And as a quick example of how you can change really small things and that really set the tone for your website, I wanted to give you some examples. So here, Offscreen is a magazine that's kind of like a really hip, trendy tech magazine. Um, I've worked with them before, and they're really awesome. And so for their blog section, they've chosen the label blog. It makes sense. They're a magazine, but you're not going to be reading the articles from their magazine there. You're going to be reading articles that they've published in between issues to keep their readers interested and engaged. So uh, that's something that they've chosen, blog, very straightforward. Then this is a consulting agency that does um, document management and document creation. So it's an outsourced document creation agency that, um, that can, that's really like business oriented. So they're really focused on providing their services that are article writing, and they've chosen the word articles instead of blog because it kind of hints at like a more professional environment. Like we think of articling in law and journalism and academia, so they've chosen articles as a word. And then MIT. So MIT is a school which is also, you know, you'd think it'd be very kind of conservative and professional, um, but they're trying to show the human side of their, of their school. So they don't really have blog posts, they have more news about the campus, about research that's happening, and so it's not really blogs, it's not really articles, it's more news updates. So these are three ways that you could pretty much label the, the same thing, but sets an expectation of what you're gonna find when you click on that, on that label. So um, you expect to find news about them, or you expect to find articles that this company has written, or you expect a blog that you can engage with and get content. So these are high level things, like small decisions that really are, are you know, you get from a high level decision um, on what you want your website to say. 
And so after you've determined all of that, then it's implementing the rules. So being consistent is really what's going to help your website succeed and help your readers have a better, a better flow or a better user experience through, throughout your website. So um, you know, even if you have a simple website, knowing that if you're talking about your blog, that throughout your website, everything says, follow the blog. Or if they receive a confirmation email, it says, thank you for subscribing to our blog, that you're not calling it you know, something different in every little place. And so you know, that gets even more complicated if you have membership sites, or if you have e-commerce sites, um, or if you are doing like event management and things like that. So you know, when you're talking about people that are engaging with your website, are they your user? Are they your member, your subscriber, your visitor, your reader? They may be all of those, but you kind of want to narrow in on one label that you're going to give them. Um, if people are engaging with your website by signing up, you know, are they subscribing? Are they purchasing tickets? Are they joining something? Are they RSVPing? You want to make those decisions from day one so that when you build your website, um, you're continuing to use the same label and you're being consistent. Uh, I know I've seen, I, online you see a lot of like basket, bag, cart, shopping cart. There's a lot of different ways that you can label that. And so it's making these decisions from the get-go and being able to implement them throughout your design process is really going to allow your website visitors to understand where you're going and feel like they're supported in the actions that they do on your website. If you've worked in UX at all, you know the idea of a flow. So a flow is basically like if you're engaging with the screen, what did you see before? What are you going to see after? Where are you going on this journey? What are the options? Where is it going to branch out? And so one of the experiences that, one of the things that helps when you're designing, even just as a copy content writer, um, is to put yourself in the shoes of your website visitor and going through these flows yourself. Um, and so this is a really interesting exercise, but it's also a little bit uh, tedious. So my, um, my recommendation for flows is to just do like Excel spreadsheets and to um, track what you're doing on your website. So if you start on one screen, you, let's say your experience starts with Facebook. So maybe you're very active on Facebook, but you want to get people to come to your website. What is it that people are going to be engaging with on Facebook? What are they going to click on to get to your website? That's already one action. It's one part of the flow. Once they get to your website, what are they going to do on their website? Do you want them to read your blog posts? Do you want them to subscribe after? What is that experience like? Is it successful? Are you getting them to, to subscribe and to, um, to do the actions that you want? Where are they getting lost? You know, maybe you want them to subscribe, but the subscribe button is on a different page and it's not popping up when they're reading your blog posts. Um, all of these flows are things that you really want to walk through yourself so that you can put yourself in the shoes of your website visitors and see where there might be gaps. Where, see where there might be missed opportunities. Maybe you know, you're reading through a piece of content, and this is the perfect time to highlight that you have an event coming up. And so these are things that you want to, to, you really can only see if you go through your website again and again and start tracking these flows. And that's where you can also see where your words can make a difference. So if you're going through these flows and you see missed opportunities, it could just mean editing that text so that it's a little more powerful, or that it actually like, conveys something that, um, that is, like, points to an action. It could mean that you're confusing your users because you've started to use different language in different spots. And those are things that you can start to highlight at this point in the process. Um, you also have options. Like a lot of the time, it's a choose your own adventure kind of experience when people are going through your website. And so to see where they may branch off, um, it's fun to also get people that aren't familiar with your product or aren't familiar with your site at all to come in and to start using it and to be like, okay, where would you naturally go after this? Or what's your inclination? Or how are you feeling right now? And so to have people go through these flows and to express out loud what, what they're experiencing can be really helpful. And so you may have a really simple website and, but have tons of flows and not even know it. For example, the Facebook that example I gave. Um, if you have a blog and you want people to sign up or you want them to continue reading more articles on your site. If you have forms and prompts, if you have products, and if you're having feature tours, then you definitely know what flows are because you're getting people to go through your product um, right there. And navigational links and search filters, all of these things are flows that people will use going, uh, as they go through your website. And so you want your microcopy to encourage, you want it to reassure, uh, you want it to, uh, to make people more knowledgeable and certain about what they're doing. And essentially, that's, that's really the goal, is you want to design with empathy because you want your website visitors to feel good 
when they're on your site. You want, don't want them to be confused. You don't want them to feel like they're an idiot. You want them to feel like um, they're there, they're in the right place, and that they know what's next, and that they're going to be able to come out of their accomplishing what they were hoping for. And so there's a book that I really like called Nicely Said. It's geared primarily towards copywriters. It's called, um, it's written by Nicole Fenton and Kate Kieferly, and I'll tweet it out after this talk. Um, but there is a chapter about improving flows, and they give a list of questions that you can use when you're mapping it out. So what is the reader trying to do? What could the reader be feeling? How did the reader get here? And what's happening next? And what choices can they make? So this points back to the choose your own adventure. You know, maybe you have too many choices on your site. So if you want to push people into a flow, but you're telling them, sign up for my event, subscribe to my blog post, follow me on Facebook, um, you know, go to our, our store. Those are a lot of different messages. And you, know, you may want to focus on a couple of them, or you may want to have a hierarchy, um, because it may end up being a little bit too much um, in one particular flow. And that's part of putting yourself in their shoes. You know, what is happening in this frame? Um, is it like overloaded or confusing? Does it relate to the frames before and after? Is it complete? Maybe there's something missing here. And does everything sound like it came from the same place? And so that's like a final, like the last one is definitely a copywriting tip because it points back to the tone of voice. Does this sound like the same person as the previous screen or all of a sudden is it super cold? Um, did we lose that familiarity? Or maybe it's the opposite. Maybe you, know, you have a flow that's like very corporate and then all of a sudden there's this joke and you're like, it feels out of place. These are not bad decisions in and of themselves, but they just don't work together. And then you know, a lot of it is, is feelings. A lot of people um, underestimate how many decisions are fueled by feelings. And so when you have people on your website and you have them um, feeling fearful, then you know, it's going to work against you. But you can help. And some of the decisions that you can make can really help to undo those feelings of fear. And so a lot of the common ones that you want to think about for people to come on your website is um, you know, if they're signing up, fear of irreversible change. So picking a username, for example. You know, when I'm picking a username, I'm, part of me is like, OK, how visible is this username? If I pick something stupid, am I stuck with it forever? Like when I first signed up to Twitter like 10 years ago, I picked a really stupid handle. And I was like, OK, I can't change this. I'm going to, like, this is, uh, there's some element of fear that, that keeps you from doing it. And so being able to support people and let them know when the changes is reversible or when there's a little bit of flexibility will help them to complete the action more quickly and with more confidence. There's also a fear of data loss. So if any of you, for example, use two-factor authentication, there's a screen where they say, here are your secret codes. Save these. If you navigate away from this page, they'll be gone forever. And so if that's communicated, then you know, it sort of helps fix that fear of data loss or fear of, of doing something and, and not saving it. Or if you like, click back, you haven't saved the form that you've filled out. And so all of these things are thing can um, prevent your users from moving safely through your flows and having a good time. Um, there's also fear about personal data security. I mean, that's something that we've all been really familiar with since like the European GDPR and everything. It's like people care about how their personal information is going to be stored and kept and collected, shared, used. All of that is information that they probably want if they're filling out a very detailed form. So you want to make sure that you give information about that, like not just for the legal purposes, but also um, to help your, your visitors feel more secure in what they're doing and trust you more. And then, of course, the fear of getting spammed. I've filled out a lot of forms recently that sort of tell you why they need your email address, what they intend to do with it, and at what frequency you can expect a newsletter, for example. So you know, if it says outright, we're, we're going to email you weekly, you know, it kind of sets the tone and gives a little bit more information about uh, what you're signing up for, which is nice. So through all of these flows, you can use copy to help users get started. Encourage them. Encourage them to start you know, using your website in the way that you intended it. Um, let users know what to do next. So like for the example that there's lots of things that you could do, whether it's subscribe or follow you on Facebook and all these things, um, you can encourage users sort of to do a couple of actions and use words that are more encouraging in that sense. You can explain new features. I mean, a lot of the time we are working on our websites and we're making them better. And so your users might come back and find something completely different. But if you use copy to explain it, then it's a lot more reassuring. And if you have slight changes in a familiar context, they're much more well received. You can also reduce cognitive effort. 
which is basically like people don't want to make decisions. I think there's a lot of decision fatigue. So if you can just buy your coffee, help people to uh, feel confident about the decision that you're making for them, then um, they'll be better off. So just by making it easier for them to make decisions, like removing any of that friction of having to read and understand things um, helps them to have a better experience on your site. You can also suggest users to take a certain action. So maybe you do have multiple options, but if you can program your website to sort of guess where they're going, you can then prompt them with some, some more um, targeted action-oriented action language. And you can also help users in a moment of failure. And so I'll talk about that in a little bit. But this is like error screens, for example. So if they do something wrong on your website, you don't want to reprimand them. You want to help them. Um, and so just like basic guidelines, if you're looking at doing some, some changes today on your website, what are some things you can look at? Um, check for typos. That's an obvious one. They slip in all the time. So you want to make sure that you're rereading your stuff, checking it, or having someone else take a look at it so that you have a second pair of eyes. Um, edit for consistency. Now that you've developed this great like, brand tone of voice, you can go through your screens and evaluate it and think, OK, does this fit with what we've determined as a company, as an organization? Does this fit with what we want to be saying and how we want to be saying it? Review the order. You know, Maybe there's some screens that just don't make sense in that sequence, or someone's pointed out that it just feels out of place. Um, and you want to narrow the focus. So you don't want to bombard people with too much stuff. And timing as well. You know, maybe it's just um, it's part of the order, but maybe it's just like there's a message that comes at the wrong time or a bit too soon. So it ends up creating more fear and confusion than, than if it had just been moved a little bit further when the user was more knowledgeable. So things like that that you can think of. Sometimes it also just means really small changes, like adding headers to your content, adding uh, more buttons, or adding like separating text. Sometimes it can be a really simple uh, solution to, to, some, to a problem like that. And you also want to determine what level of information you want to give. And so that's like, no one has the perfect answer for this. But basically, the sweet spot sets clear expectations while staying out of someone's way. So you want to give them enough information that they don't feel like you're patronizing, but also you don't want to overwhelm them. And so that's something that usually goes with testing. There's no, there's no perfect answer. And I'll, I'll briefly touch upon accessibility. It's not my forte. I'm not a developer, and I'm not an accessibility specialist. But I know that there are some small things that you can do when you're editing your microcopy in your website um, that can help, help it be more accessible. Some of that is like using label elements in your buttons and in your content, using precise language. So not, not um, relying on the interface itself to communicate, but actually having the label say something specific. Because if you're thinking about someone who um, is using a screen reader, for example, that's the only bit of information they're going to be getting. So you want to make sure it's as precise as possible. Uh, and all microcopies should appear as live text. No images with text, please. That doesn't, that doesn't translate, unless you have really good alt tags, that doesn't translate into a screen reader. They're not going to see the text that's in an image. Um, so, and make sure the tooltip text is accessible. So if you have pop-ups on your site that give more information on how to navigate, um, you want to make sure those are accessible, too, so they're not, they're not hidden. And also, one tip that I like to do is just to read your content out loud without looking at the site. Because then it gives you an idea of like someone who's using a screen reader, without these visual cues, this is what they're going to be experiencing. Is this clear? Is this enough? So now that I've said a lot of information, now I'm going to contradict myself and say, keep it simple. It's not that hard, right? It's so easy. But it's true that keeping it simple is a good place to start and to build from. Um, and it just allows you also to pare down and to get back to the basics and to, to help you. Um, also, it also, like, will help people who uh, are new to the internet and new to these complex things. Keeping it simple will help them feel more comfortable. And so as you know, simply as it is, a lot of it is just rewriting your text so that it's clear it's active, it's precise, like I mentioned before. Avoid using jargon and idioms. I think that as a copywriter, I get really excited about puns and play on words, and I want things to be fun, and I want things to be funny. Um, but at the end of the day, I, you know, I'm not think when I do that, I'm thinking about myself. I'm not thinking about my, my user. I'm not thinking about people that are on my website who don't speak English that well or uh, who don't understand the industry that well, and so I'm using this jargon that like, doesn't really speak to them at all. 
Uh, and so, you know, I've changed the way that I approach things drastically because I want to make sure that I'm understood. And that is my main goal. Uh, if you're not understood, what's the point? And so I replace ambiguous language and I focus on one idea, one task at a time. I don't try and jam it all in. So where do you start when you're trying to fix these things on your website? Do you start with your homepage? Do you start with your menu labels? Do you start with your checkout? Um, I would say that the best place to start is the number one action that you want people on, to do on your site. So for you, I mean, the homepage is a big one. You want people to stay on your site. That's the first one. You don't want them to leave. And then the next thing is maybe you have an, a site that's for one specific event. So then your goal is to sell tickets. So then you might want to just focus on that as an action. Um, but for these examples, I'll focus on three things that most sites have and most sites can fix fairly easily. The first one is forms. So everyone who has a blog probably has a contact form. That's a very simple one. Um, but as your website becomes more complex, your forms may get more complex and you may have more of them on your site and they may be very diverse too. Um, but here's a basic example of a way that you could change small things on your form and that would impact your tone of voice and your success rate. So for this example, like this one, this is the standard one that comes built into Jetpack. And again, like when you're building websites, a lot of the stuff you're going to be using is plugins, templates, forms, um, things that come with like basically pre-written text and it works. So it's not like our first reflex to go in and change everything because if it's working, it's great, um, but it could be working better. Uh, so for this, you know, a form, for example, I would add a little bit of intro text at the beginning. What is this form about? What are people going to be doing? What, um, wh what is it related to? And some encouraging information like sign up to get my newsletter because X, Y, Z. Um, you could also change the way that the labels function. So instead of saying name, you could say your name. Or if you want it to be super friendly, it could be like, what's your name? Question mark. Um, you could add placeholder text. So if there is something that's a little bit confusing, for example, again, your name seems like a really simple field, but it could be really complicated if you're talking about like when you book a plane ticket, it's very important that you write your name properly because it has to reflect your passport. So these are things that people might get confused and they're like, do I put my middle name? Do I not? And so by building out that label and having first name, middle name, last name, or adding little instructions that say as it appears on your passport, these are things that can help uh, your users feel more confident filling out the form and also avoid mistakes and all the things that can happen if they fill it out wrong. Uh, and so add placeholder text is also an easy way to give people an idea of what that field should contain, um, of formatting too, you know, if it's phone numbers and stuff, um, you know, if you have a, a, a CRM or something where you're managing a lot of contacts and you have people's phone numbers in all sorts of different formats and stuff, you know, just fixing your form might help you save some time as well. Um, an explanation of why do you need my website? What are you going to do with that? Um, and some helper text, like what, what to expect with that field. These are some small ways that you can make your, your form like a little bit more friendly. Uh, so again, like always use a label, use placeholder text, um, highlight required fields. So this is one, you know, if, if I want to fill out a form super quickly, I want to know what are the fields that I absolutely need to fill out so I can move on with my life and which ones are not necessary. Uh, flag errors. So if someone fills it out wrong, don't just say error. Like highlight which question has an error and why. Uh, make clear buttons and customize the follow-up message. So if I fill out a form and I get a confirmation email, I kind of expect the confirmation email to reflect what I just did. So if I signed up to someone's um, mailing list and I get an email that says like something completely different, that's going to be a really bad experience. So I want to make sure that I customize all the triggers that happen after I complete the form to match with the form content itself. The next one is the checkout. And so um, there's a lot of documentation on how to build the perfect e-commerce website. I am not a specialist in that by any means, um, but I know that when you are working on a checkout, you're basically working against like fear of loss. People are gonna be giving you money. So you wanna be working um, to help them feel more confident about their purchase and not feel like they're losing money. You want to make, feel like they're getting value. So part of that is alleviating users' concerns. Um, you want to be reassuring them. Like, as they're working through the checkout process, you want to make sure that they know, like, almost done, almost there. You're going to get your item. It's going to be so great. 
And if they're stalled on any of the questions, you want to give them all the information right up front so they don't navigate away. For example, uh, return policies. Um, that's my first question. If I'm not sure about a purchase, I'm like, I'll go through with the purchase if I know that there's a really good return policy. So having a link and having that information right up front will avoid people just navigating away and then forgetting about it and never coming back. Uh, so these are some things that you can do. So you also want to motivate action. So as people are moving through the process, you want to encourage them and point them towards completing an action. And you want to turn an empty state into a trigger. So um, so many sites are building these because I think they're starting to be built into the platforms themselves. So I know there are a lot of extensions in WooCommerce that do this. Shopify does a great job of doing it as well. Um, if you have an empty cart or you were about to add something to a cart, the system will know and it'll send you a message that says like, your cart's empty, so sad. Or you have something in your cart but you haven't checked out. Um, and so turning these empty states, like they call them, into an opportunity to push someone to complete the purchase is something that you can do with writing as well. And that's it for, that's all I'm going to say about e-commerce websites. I'm going to move on to error messages. Uh, because there are so many error messages possible on a site. And I don't think I've ever edited my own error messages until like this year. I just kind of assumed that if something was broken, the error message that the developer wrote is probably going to be sufficient. It'll work. People will figure it out. But actually, error messages are some, are some of the most frustrating parts of a website when you're a user. You're like, where did I go wrong? I just want to sign up for this stupid email list. You know, these, like, these things that can cause real frustrations um, and that leave people with a really negative experience of your site. And unfortunately, negative experiences outweigh positive ones when people think back about, about an experience with the brand. So you want to make sure that you're helping people along even if they mess up on your site. Or maybe sometimes it's your own fault. So you want to make sure that you're doing it right. So you want to make sure that they match the tone. Um, if your site's been fairly conservative up until then, you don't want your error message to be like too funny. It just doesn't fit. Um, and you also want to, but you want to strike a balance and diffuse a moment of frustration. So you don't want to make them more frustrated by blaming them, you know, by sort of sounding patronizing. Um, so you know, for example, this this is a decent one. Network problem. Uh, this is what happens when too many people watch cat videos at the same time. Try again in a little bit. Sigh. Okay. So this one is it's super friendly. It's not perfect for every website. It's not going to be a good fit. But it's just a way to be like, listen, there's a problem. No fault of your own. It's on us. Um, try again in a little bit. And then it just kind of has empathy. It's like, sigh. Okay, that's, you know, what else are you going to do? Um, and so you can work with the different, you can work with your developers, for example. Go through your site, determine where all these error messages could pop up, and focus on the ones where it's like a crucial action. Again, stupid example, but if you have an event website and your main action is getting people to buy a ticket for your event, you want to focus on all the places where that can break down throughout the flow, all the places where there can be errors. You want to make sure that the error message instructs people on how to fix their mistake, what it is that you're expecting, um, and how they can then, and, and like the payoff and what they'll get when they complete it. So that is basically, I've rushed through so much content, but I'm going to leave you with a couple of resources. The book that I mentioned that I really appreciate, it's mostly geared towards copywriters and content writers, but there's so much good information on how to make your website as um, successful as possible with, with the written word. UX Planet, great website for all sorts of UX tips. I'm not a UX designer. I'm a journalist and a copywriter, so I rely heavily on experts to inform the decisions that I make. And Accessible Microcopy, because uh, I really just had one slide on that, but I encourage everyone to check out more accessibility tips and tricks for your website. So, um, and uh, again, I'll be um, tweeting these out in a second. So, thank you so much. I'm happy to take any questions. Yes. I want to echo and support what you said about the error uh, forms. One of the things I find uh, challenging is to convey to users the, the people I'm developing for is that they need to tell you in advance what the restrictions are to your password mm. or what the restrictions are to your username or whatever first, yeah. not after you've given them an error <laughs> message telling them that it should have been this way. It's one of the biggest bugaboos between that mm. and the, the order of how a date needs to go in, whether it's mm. month, day, year, year, day, month, American, Canadian, whatever, yeah. European. It's absolutely one of the hardest things I've had to try to explain to them, it's like you need to say to them in advance about this. He says, ah, the error message will take care of it. 
And I'm like, you've already got a frustrated user. Yeah. You don't want that. Yeah. And it's, yeah, if everybody would just do that, I would be a happy camper. Cool. Got that, everyone? Take notes? <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. I would say one of the things that should be mentioned too is the bottom line. Don't write long blocks of text. Mm. Break up into paragraphs. If you want a really bad example of that, go to what Marriott put up yesterday about uh, uh, all their security breach. Yeah. yeah. Security stuff. breach. It's mm. like it's small print and it's one paragraph and you're saying, what the hell do I do here? Yeah. <laughs> They probably don't Elsewhere want you to read it. You get an email if you have an issue. Yeah. But it, you know, that's a really bad example. But I find you've got to break it up. Pe yeah, people's attention spans are extremely short. So you're absolutely and, and right. It's important to get what you really want to grab the attention on the first page. Yeah. In, in terms of something for the school. But yeah. maybe they didn't want you to read it. Yeah. <laughs> 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 The lawyers are reading it so they can see. Yeah. <laughs> That's the nice thing with Gutenberg, too, is we have a little bit more control over our content now. And so, you know, even if you're not a developer, you can be building in headers and sections and paragraphs and making it easier for people to retain salient points in, in one big context, of, you know, one big block of text. And you can create your own buttons. So that's also a nice opportunity to do just that, to work with the ever diminishing attention spans of readers and users. A friend of mine was running the chapter website. Mm -hmm. And they had their thing to sign up and buy something. And they put in their credit card information and everything else, and then they'd mail a check in. <laughs> Five percent of their transactions they had to send a check back. Wow. Checks. Mm. So again, yeah, not ex <coughs> not um, knowing what people are gonna do. Yeah. Any other questions? All right. I'll be around all afternoon if you want to chat with me. So thanks so much for attending. Mm -hmm.